Tiger Six, from Ambient Reports, 2087, written and read by Sean Kennedy. Global Audubon, West Africa. It's never good to drop under 200 in West Africa. Frank downshifted and powered through the last of three turns. Turns were bad. They gave attackers a place where speed dropped and vision was limited. With no obstructions, the corner was behind him and out of sight before he shifted again. The engine revolutions were either climbing or falling. With nine gears of high-speed transmission, the blur of the street crept into tunnel vision as Frank poured on the power. Tiger 6, this is dispatch. We have you inbound on main line 2 and cleared on lane 7 Charlie to unload on dock 14, said a tin voice coming through his immersion link. Excellent trip time, Tiger 6. It finished. Tiger 6 acknowledged, Frank said, and the gliding monster slid over into an immersion augmented light tunnel on the road known as main line 2. Frank passed into the two clicks of dead space asphalt on the ultra resort approach. Gunners, scanners, and anything else with a crosshair would be trained on the vehicle and sweeping the internals, looking for attached physical or virtual weapons. Frank could relax a little now, drop the speed to just above a hundred. It felt like he was crawling, but he savored the few minutes of relaxation. Flashing giant numbers swept over the vehicle like ghosts. The global autobahn is the safest way to travel, but that isn't to say it's safe. Shoulder-launched anti-aircraft weapons are more common than rifles in West Africa. While in the air, anyone could see you and take a shot. Downed aircraft got stripped before the metal stopped burning. Part of the mystique and draw of the crazy West African party culture was its deadly nature, but there was nothing natural about Zef Voodoo. Zef Voodoo took hold as casual contact with Western culture began to permeate the West African subculture. Zef Voodoo was a pseudo-religion that was far deadlier than the weaponized mainstream faiths. No Christian, Jewish, or Muslim extremist could compare to the dangers of Zef Voodoo. Synth Hungans ran extortion cults full of brain-fried followers called lizards by drivers. Lizard people were created when the base reptile part of the human brain took over. They were still human, but permanently, psychologically changed into a dangerously chaotic creature. They lived like animals, hunting in packs and following the whims of their synth hoon guns like reptiles on sport bikes. Each pack paid homage to its warlord, all controlled by tight drug production. Cannibalism was preferred, and no one lived long enough for Kuru to be a problem. Human sacrifices were a dinnertime affair, and daily suicides were tribal recreation. Everyone was fed a constant stream of weaponized aggression drugs, and lost recruits burnt out from the African labor mines were never-ending. The mega-resorts turned into ultra-resorts, the separation of the tourist from the environment was complete. Every experience was catered for them, from the flowers on their pillows to the sex at the bars. The more you paid, the more you could do. In Liberia, nothing was beyond possibility. Invariably, any client of a resort kept at least two resort-employed guides with them to ensure that this was the greatest experience of their lives. Frank never saw them. They were just a stat in his mind's eye display. He could tell how many passengers he had, if they were alive and moving around, but that was it. Frank was a transporter, a driver who moved cargo. To do this, he drove Tiger Six, a Warlord Rally town car. All eight wheels had independent eye drive and steering, powered by atomic electrics. He could hit the speed of sound before the structure became affected, and it made enough power to pull itself apart. It was all up to the driver. Only lightly armored to resist small arms fire, its real defense was its power. Once Frank linked in with the immersion interface, his senses and reaction time connected with the vehicle on a neuromuscular level. You needed it to make it through transport. The lizards knew the vehicles. The more battles you won, the more they targeted you. Runs were tiered in dollar value. Once a driver registered through the market insurance company, they were placed on contract with the ultra resorts. If they wrecked, or the lizards got them, the paperwork and payout was sorted before their flesh was stripped from their cooling bones. Tiger Six didn't touch anything below Tier 3. This was the end of a Tier 2 run, from the Emerald to Atlantis, 680 kilometers in 2 hours 47 minutes, 20 minutes ahead of schedule. That's why Frank got the contracts. He'd mastered speed. Some ran heavy, cannons and gun ports, frags and flamethrowers, but the jungle was stronger. The lizard horde was endless, and eventually drivers were overwhelmed. Frank knew speed was the key. The faster he went, the slower everyone else was. A sweeping shovel ram plow attached to the front of Tiger Six. Anything it hit was scooped and thrown by 3,000 horsepower connected to shred-proof tires, a meter wide, with a meter of travel. 
Even standing still, Tiger Six was the meanest limousine the world had ever known. The first five Tigers were stripped and burned on the roadways. Most drivers topped out near a grand. After 500 runs, you were marked by the Zeph voodoo hoon guns as powerful, and the lizards would do anything to get you. Frank lost count of his runs after 2,000. Once, a lizard jumped from a sport bike onto the Tiger's roof. Frank hit the cooker, a heat shielding that made the exterior of the vehicle a few hundred degrees hotter, and hammered his speed past 400 clicks. The lizard vanished into the rear view, but at the end of the run, Frank found that the psycho had written Tiger 6 on the roof of the vehicle with the bitten off stump of his finger. That smear stuck to the roof, a painted warning to show they knew him. No passenger vehicles could catch the drivers, but motorcycles could. They were hydrogen-powered two-wheel racing missiles sold with suicidal solid-fuel rocket packs. Frank didn't think about the lizard bikes much. They were targets, savages, obstacles that he had to navigate through to get to his destination. He didn't go out of his way to run down attackers. Given the choice between sparing and taking a life, all drivers knew the value of a spare. It built on his mystique. Tiger Six was pursued more now because he was seen as noble, and that made him very powerful indeed. Inside the loading bay of Atlantis, he saw the pitters going over the car, local workers who were screened and tested before brought in to work as outside staff for the ultra resorts. Pitters made more working for the resort than some warlords did. Real money. And everyone wanted to live in the protected camps with their families. To be fired from the resort was to be ejected from the camp. Because of this, pitters worked like slaves. If they saw someone watching them, they smiled and worked a little faster. To watch pitter crews work was a thing of beauty. Through his mind's eye, Frank could see every inch of Tiger Six. The reverence the pitters showed in even the most basic tasks was incredible. They treated the machines like animals, great noble beasts who gave the pitters their livelihood. Frank saw them praying over tires, blessing fuel and anointing themselves with sacred oil. The machines and drivers gave them everything. Was it wrong to be thankful? Frank learned to respect the pitters in the free zone during the early anarchy years of the global Autobahn. It circled Africa before connecting to Europe, Russia, and through the land bridge to North and South America. Driving, Frank learned there was nothing that couldn't be left behind, so he'd ran his entire life. Tier Zero Contract, Freetown, 593 kilometers, 2 hours, 54 minutes. The flashing green contract message appeared in the overlay. The joke went that it was called Tier Zero because there was zero chance of survival. This would be Frank's third Zero run. On the first, he'd extracted clients from a resort that was overrun during the Skeleton Uprising, a time when three resorts were destroyed in the Ivory Coast. The second was on a run escorting someone with a sizable price on his head, having run afoul of the rest of the corporate world. Statistically, zero runs gave the same odds as a game of Russian roulette with two chambers unloaded. Frank keyed in the acceptance code for the run. The Freetown Ultra Resort was the Forbidden City, the deadliest ultra resort in the world. Murder sport and flesh fantasies were painted as forbidden pleasures there. It was the edge in a land of extremes, located in a war-torn region of what used to be called Sierra Leone. The Freetown hordes were deadly and fast and numerous. It was the evolutionary pressure of the area that made this a zero run. Frank had put enough money away to quit. But then what? The shift of gears was his heartbeat, and the roar of the engine his voice. There might come a day when he would walk away, drop the keys, and go to live his stopped life, tell everyone stories of how fast he used to be, but that day was not today. Three passengers were loaded through a hall that was carpeted and masked, air-conditioned and sanitized. Their vitals and readouts floated in his mind's eye, an obese male accompanied by two playthings who would keep him busy all along the way. Almost 500 pounds of meat cargo, rich, fresh, and ready for depravity. Frank couldn't judge them too harshly. Some like flesh, others like drugs. He lived for speed. The reactor was fueled, the clients were loaded. Franks flexed and Tiger responded by revving its engine. Some drivers liked to know everything about their environment before they started out, but to Frank there was only what was moving and what was not. When in doubt, drop the hammer and leave it all behind. He cranked up his telephoto dash cam and saw Magic 9 picking up speed across the security range field, heading towards the northern exit. He was making the same run, most likely. On a heavy run, they split up vehicles to minimize losses. Tiger 6, this is Atlantis. Please hold for departure clearance, came a pleasant man's voice across the channel. The route to the destination was Frank's choice. Waiting on the tarmac, Tiger 6 drove in a long, lazy loop, staying in motion for his clients. People got worried if they stopped, but as long as the tires rolled, everyone stayed happy. 
There was nothing to do but start, but Atlantis Tower wanted to give Magic Nine some distance. Frank hoped Magic Nine hammered out of there soon. The long, slow holding circles were making a itch. At last, the voice of an angel. Tiger Six, this is Atlantis Dispatch. You are cleared to leave on departure gate 16. Godspeed, Tiger Six. Dispatch, this is Tiger Six, departing gate 16, he replied and tightened his grip on the road. Tiger Six drifted from its easy elliptic and followed the transparent rings towards the gate on the northern side of the secure zone. That gave Frank 2,000 meters to get Tiger Six up to speed. The client compartment's inertial dampening, coupled with the experience guides, kept the client preoccupied enough for Frank to flip end over end and not notice. A thousand meters from the gate, Frank's speed passed 300. The power of Tiger Six flowed through him. He sucked in air through his intakes and felt revolutions in his chest. At 327, he was just entering his comfort zone. This was a light load. Visibility was good, and his tank was full. He flew out the gates to the road, his road, where he was born to be. In an abandoned airport hangar, just inside Liberia's border, with darkened doorways and burning torches, Kobe waited amongst the chanting. Around him, fires presided over by warlords screaming words not known until said. They'd sat sweating in the darkness for days. Once recognized, once chosen by Kobe himself, they could recruit. They would each have their own circle of power in which to distribute the magic of Kobe, the never-ending paradise of science that would make it so... Make it so. Great holes in the hangar's roof let smoke pour out where mortars once reigned in. Their targets had left the foreign tower, and soon they would come through his land. Separated from the spirit of the earth, the invaders would bring the gifts of power he needed. Kobe pulled his dagger from its German albino sheath and held it aloft to boost his implant transmission. He broadcast the hunt signal to the legions surrounding him, and their garbled chanting grew louder in waves of anticipation. All transmissions were stronger through fighting blades. Frequency gods loved to play amongst the razors. It begins. Severed human fingers were soaking in bowls of three quinuclidinol benzolate since the fires were lit three days ago. Following Kobe's direction, his acolytes ensured the fingers were fresh, so they'd still have enough life to hold the powerful chemical magic. Kobe took a digit from the bowl and tapped it against his lips. The fingers of his bowl were the freshest. Sweet child fingers, so tender and swollen with magic. Immediately the drug pulsed, and he felt a, the wave like blood pouring over his body. The power of his god filled him. Two of the followers in his circle stopped breathing, taken by the gods to watch from higher up. A sacrifice to the hunt. Screaming. Rage was a god called by screaming, and the chemical god brought power into the eyes of the followers. The loa of needles and steel, the spirit poured into the body from chemical fingers, and the power came. Kobe screamed, feeling the coolness as his blood vessels and his eyes versed and the clarity of his vision grew. Staggering and howling as he rode the loa, he reached for the handlebars of his Suzubishi GRZ-1600. Its electric engine's whine added to the shrill of dying as chemicals judged the horde. He cracked the throttle and listened to the power of a god. With this power, the worthy flew and reached their prey. Other engines joined the screaming into a roar of bloodlust. The world opened as the great hangar doors slid wide, and the light from the West African sun burned the strip, bone, urine, and feces smeared on the hangar's floor. Feeling the rage, Kobe pointed his bike skyward and tore through the open doors. His people saw, and they followed. They were connected like a swarm of wasps, all following the spirit of their blood, out onto the abandoned airport runway, where Magic Nine could be seen rocketing in the distance. Kobe chewed and sucked the severed finger like a cigar. The tiny bone was crushed between his teeth, its soaked marrow releasing a fresh dose of the drug. All was screaming in speed. The lizards were amazing. Because of this, Frank learned not to trust the transponders. Tiger's sonar echo checked every stretch of flat road. Once at speed, there was no one to trust. The Autobahn felt good enough through his neuromuscular link. His tires gripped the hard pack, but it would get dodgy past 450 kilometers per hour in the African sun. He flexed, pouring speed on. 360, 370, 380. Approaching border, the warlord's guidance system informed him. A sonar pulse bounced and showed the roadway clear except for the usual trash. Frank felt the road clutter blast off Tiger Six Bram plow. Tires and burnt slag piles smashed into powder and fell like ash and snow after Tiger Six passed. He slipped into a gradual, rounded sweep 
where buildings and structures on the side of the road grew out of the earth like fungus. Made from a different mixture of burnt synthetics and mud, the structures looked abandoned. Through his air intake, a few suspicious odors set off a tingle in Frank's nose. Jam smoke rendered most sensors useless, and the lingering smell brought memories flooding back to his mind like a lover's voice. The road straightened and he saw a white cloud in the distance, sweeping over the road like a sand dune. Frank sent another sonar pulse ahead. The smoke came back as a solid object. Jam meant someone knew he was coming. Jam smoke was created to stick low, never going more than a few stories off the ground. The fine particulates acted as Faraday cages, leveling the battlefield for low-tech daggers hiding in cloaks. Frank widened his vision and brought the speed up. Tiger Six slammed into the cloud on the road. Driving through smoke at high speed was an acquired skill. The smoke was thin, giving him thirty meters variable visibility depending on the wind. A burning hulk was smashed into one of the mud wall barriers, still burning. The smoldering remains of a lizard man were embedded in the wall. Frank froze an image and brought it up in Immersion's mind's eye. Judging by the body crush on the embed, the lizard was doing 300 when he hit. Skid marks and tire tracks swirled on the Autobahn hardpack. Frank recognized Magic's tread pattern. The lizards were after him. Frank cranked up his acoustic amps. Acoustic amps were designed to filter out the noise of Tiger Six, but amplify organic sounds from the outside. It was useful for sirens or gunfire. Lizards could use the jam to stop any wireless transmissions except sound. It carried further in the smoke. For someone who knew how to filter and listen, hearing could reach further than your sight could. A millisecond calibration later, Frank picked up the sound of many bikes singing like hornets ahead of him, the chorus growing louder as they got closer. With a thought, Frank's sound filters blocked out the motorcycle's wind. He heard another sound, hidden, quieter than a bike's, a rending noise, the sound of torn metal, and a woman screaming in agony. A body-bike mass, fused together in a wreck, struck Tiger Six's ram plow and was thrown up into the smoke. More skid marks emerged, dancing and sliding beneath the wheels. In the closing distance, Frank saw the glow of flame. No matter where the fire was, the lizards would be all around it. He cracked his wheels up to 435. The temporal distortion of speed gave Frank a sliver more time to react. From the smoke, long shapes appeared standing beside their bikes, their arms out like crosses. They were greeters, a lizard battle tradition, demonstrating their fearlessness. Frank slammed into them, throwing broken flesh and bikes off Tiger Six ram plow. What was the glow from one fire was now the glow from many, as snapshot reality came into temporally slowed view. Magic Nine was on its roof, its tire and armor torn away by lizard men crawling over it like ants on a flipped turtle. A crowd dragged Magic Nine from the cab and ripped his body open, stuffing themselves with the power of his meat. A bald man was on his knees, trying to scream as his eyes and tongues were cut out in the passenger compartment. In the distance, a crowd was laughing, toying with a woman, one of the guides from Magic Nine. They all clapped, stamping and screaming, making her dance on the road as they sang their slaughter songs. If she was lucky, she would be killed quickly. If not, she would live a life of agony as a trophy of the lizards. They might only carve off a piece of her at a time as a delicacy, a hand for dessert, a breast as an offering. By design, it was almost impossible to hear Tiger Six coming. Its stealth gave it added security during a run. By the time the tormenting lizards realized the great beastly body of Tiger Six was upon them, it was too late. They were mid-clap and mid-stomp, driving themselves into lust-filled frenzy when Tiger Six sliced like an arrow through their midst. Frank didn't make the decision. There was no time for decision-making. There was only the instant of action. He twisted sideways and cranked the speed up to 550, breaking all eight tires free from the road, drifting Tiger Six's 13-meter body sideways and popping his passenger side door as the car began to slow dangerously. The cockpit's gullwing door flashed open and the boarding ramp ejected down just off the road. The first bit of good luck the dancing girl had was her shoes. The ramp snapped her stiletto heels, saving her ankles, and scooped her into the passenger seat. The gullwing slammed shut as the warlord turned. Frank hammered it, and the vehicle straightened, sending smashed lizards flying in all directions. She wasn't dead. Any injuries she'd suffered would be painful, but nothing could compare to what the lizards would have done to her. In truth, he wasn't sure why he'd even scooped her. It would have been easier to just to laser through the crowd and go. They couldn't message ahead to set up a roadblock. That jam smoke was a tricky blade, and now Tiger Six had the edge. With his senses maxed and taking in as much blind data as he could, 
The tiger blasted from the edge of the jam cloud like a burning dog. As quick as thought, Frank fired a sonar pulse down the Autobahn. Roadblocks were a bad idea to stop transports. Most of the machines were designed as blockade runners, so the popular choice was lance bombs, massive explosive charges fixed to a long spear, which would detonate on contact. Lizards drove these lances under target vehicles and blasted them up just enough to make them lose control and roll. Once it was rolling, the transport was finished. The same high speeds that gave drivers the edge ripped their armor apart. On the same breath, that sonar pulse came back clear. Frank did a two-second check on his new co-pilot, detaching from the external cams. She was a priceless treasure tossed into wreckage. Frank heard the Ultra Results did premium cosmetic work on their experience guides, and he saw some pretty fine women in his travels. But even crumpled and unconscious, she was something else entirely. No wonder lizards made her dance. She almost looked too good to touch, like art. Frank supported her head and shoulders as best he could as he belted her in, looking for blood on her lily-white skin. It was hard not to keep looking at her, but if he wasn't careful, she would be the last thing he would ever see. No time. He threw himself back into the machine to feel something bounce off the plow's grill. The object was still airborne when it drifted out of sight. He checked the cockpit vitals. His new passenger was alive and breathing well, and looked all the world like she was sleeping. His principal cargo wasn't broken and bleeding either. So far, so good. Multiple vehicles approaching from behind, the onboard systems reported. Seems like someone has other plans for you, princess, Frank said. The lizard men's bike screamed towards them, with riders lost in a drug-fueled flesh frenzy. The front bike passengers were holding on precariously, wielding long lances with bundles on their ends, blast lances, and a rowdy amount of them. They were coming up fast, and if they were successful in getting a blast lance under Frank's axles, this trip would be a lot shorter than anyone wanted. Tiger Six had power, but power didn't mean the fight was won. It was how it was applied. Technique was everything, and for a bunch of stone lizards riding race bikes, they had surprisingly good technique. Mm. A gentle moan came from beside him. Sleeping Beauty was waking up. You're okay, Frank said, loudly enough to be sure she could hear him without getting distracted from the matter at hand. I picked you up off the road and we are continuing to your destination. Stay calm, everything will be fine. He twisted, making Tiger Six's back-end fishtail. At this speed, too much would wreck, and too little would do nothing. On the road, Tiger Six swung from side to side, bringing up a dust cloud and bouncing rocks like a smoke screen. In the rear view, Frank saw a bright orange flash on the driver's side. A lance bike went down. Another bike was coming up way too fast on the passenger side. Frank twisted again, gunning the speed. The biker came in for the kill, expecting the fishtailing axles to swing back, but instead, Tiger Six swung away into a full circle, spinning the transport in a donut on the road. The warlord's tail came crashing into the bike, throwing both riders off. They hung in the air for just long enough to scream, then the ground claimed them. The lance hit the road, exploding in a bright flash, and then the wreck was gone, left behind as Tiger Six finished the car's drifting circle. Frank felt eight tires slam into traction and willed more speed. Another sonar pulse showed the road was going to be straight for a moment. He could afford to be distracted now. He looked over at his new passenger, and that was a mistake. She'd found Frank's leather jacket on the passenger floor and slipped it over her body. Their eyes locked for a moment, and Frank sensed her probing him for intentions. With the seat belt and leather jacket, she looked like his personal pinup girl, tousled white hair framing her sculpted face. With ultra resort guides, Subtle sex prosthetics and pheromone treatments were standard to make them the most sexually stimulating humans on the planet. She wasn't only out of Frank's league, he was playing the wrong sport. You're okay, he said again in an attempt to reassure. The way she looked at him and smiled stuck him like an ice pick. Doing 400 down a West African dirt highway was normal. Women made Frank nervous. He knew he shouldn't be looking at her, not while driving at least, but it's hard not to notice a goddess in the passenger seat. Dropping back into the camera feed, he saw the lizard riders moving up in a wide line. There were a lot more of them this time. He'd never run from this many, but the main group was getting left behind. The bikes had the acceleration, but Tiger Six had the speed. A sonar pulse showed the signature of a wreck a mile down the road, but there was something beyond that. A wall of bikes coming at him with their lances down, with no cover or turns to evade them. He switched to corrective telescopic view to get a good look at the obstacle on the road, it was another transport wreck. This one he didn't recognize. It was a blackened husk only with the frame and welded armor left. 
like some great dead beetle in the middle of the road. A plan formed in Frank's mind. He pulsed the sonar behind him and saw the larger pack was coming on strong, closing the circle. No doubt this was how the mighty beetle before him was slain. Frank slowed to time the distance. He wouldn't get another shot at this. He didn't have to slow much before the rear lance riders closed in. He fishtailed wide, bringing a red cloud of dust up like ash to obscure their view. But these were experienced hunters. The bikes separated to drive their bomb lances home. Frank activated his emergency parachute. The effect was like hitting a wall. The car dropped in speed and his customer cargo hit the passenger cabin behind him. The guides would have to be pretty talented to make this seem normal, but his new co-pilot could distract him from open-heart surgery if she wanted to. The muffled thud of explosions told him the lizards hit the parachute and detonated their lances harmlessly in the fabric. He counted three explosions, then released the drag chute and turned up the speed again. The bike walls approaching from the front closed in a semicircle. Frank needed to beat them to the wreck. There was no holding back. He felt the tension of acceleration in his abs and chest as his muscles demanded more speed and power. As he spun past 400, he saw the surviving lizards in front of the parachute wreck smoke, howling with anger. The husk of the burned-out driver's rig appeared on the road ahead. Behind it, Frank saw the beginnings of the coming horde. They would be ready for his usual tricks. The lizards would bomb jack his front axles if he tried to ram through. If he slowed, the horde behind would hit his rear axles catching him between a wreck and a death race. As Franks closed the distance to the wreckage, they were upon him. With a thought, he tilted the ram plow up and away from the low-slung position that barely cleared the ground until it was in a steep, skyward angle using the maintenance hydraulics. The plow locked as its underside slammed into the steel wreck. The low-angled armor of the wreck met with the upturned ram prow like a ramp at 400 clicks. Tiger-6 jumped off the wreck and dropped its suspension system low to take the landing as Tiger-6 soared in an airborne arc over the frenzied lizard lances. Even with their drug speed, the lizards couldn't get their explosive spears skywards to hit the tiger's belly. One moment Tiger-6 was ahead of their bomb lances, the next a multi-ton racing transport was bringing death from above as it landed in their bike pack, pulling crushed steel and flesh beneath its clawing tires. A terrific sound like shattering thunder exploded through the vehicle. If they'd gotten a lance under him, the trip would have been over, but they hadn't. This was one trick they hadn't seen yet, and a learning experience for everyone. Two bikers were pulled under the vehicle as Tiger-6 dropped its ram plow back into position hard and fast. The jump had cost speed, but now the open road was ahead of them. The chaos of a lizard bike wreck exploded as they tried to avoid each other and bomb lances detonated on accidental impact. Frank exhaled the strain of the run. Optics showed the top of the Freetown Ultra Resort emerging from the scorched desert haze. A voice came coursing through the audio feed. Tiger 6, this is Freetown Dispatch. We have you inbound. Air support is en route to you. Freetown, this is Tiger 6. Much appreciated, Frank said, the way he might thank a server for a beer. His rear sonar pulse showed the horde swarming at speed, but still further back. Their numbers were fewer, and they wouldn't catch him now. Tiger-6 entered the three-kilometer sea of payment marking the security zone around the Freetown Ultra Resort. His sonar showed a gunship coming from Freetown. He watched it through telephoto lenses as it came out of the sky like a harpy seeking vengeance. A single stream of smoke came from the sands around Freetown's security zone like a laser. The gunship exploded in a cloud of fire, raining debris onto the asphalt, showing with gunshot clarity while the foreigners owned the Ultra Resorts, the lizards owned the desert. A lock alarm flashed on Frank's mind's eye. Whoever hit the bird, or someone just like them, locked on Tiger-6. Frank opened the throttle on the open asphalt. The transport was designed to deal with mobile threats and small arms. Missiles couldn't be defeated by fancy wheel work. He was a sitting duck out in the open of the security zone. A clean shot from the fringe, but no missile came. Only the steady pulse of the lock warning. Tiger-6, this is Freetown Dispatch. You are cleared for lane 4B. The lizards lost their prey, but they knew Frank would have to leave Freetown eventually. The 3,000 meters of asphalt passed in a flash, and the holographic lane numbers appeared in Frank's view, guiding Tiger-6 to the virtual docking lane. Okay, Frank said with a sigh, and turned back to his angelic co-pilot. Looks like I'm going to have you in Freetown in a few moments. Do they know I'm with you? The beauty asked, catching him off guard. He dared another look at her inviting eyes. Nope, he said. As far as they're concerned, you're back on the road, but they'll pay me a premium to deliver you. Maybe, she started. 
Maybe you don't have to tell them. Tiger 6, this is Freetown Dispatch. Please unload at Dock 7. Freetown Dispatch, this is Tiger 6. Acknowledged, Frank replied, and downshifted. Maybe I don't, he said, and winked at her as he pulled through the numbers flashing before him. Stay in the car. They won't come in here. Where do you need to go? The words fell from his lips. Anywhere, she said in a quiet voice. Frank thought about it for a moment. Well, I can go anywhere, he said, more to himself than to his passenger, but he felt the soft touch of her hands on his arm. We could go together, she said, and the transport slid to a stop. The pitters attached the loading hose and some suits came to the vehicle. My mother warned me to stay away from fast women, Frank said, and she smiled. Stay here and don't get out, he said, popping the driver's side door, slipping out, and closing it behind him. The debriefing was standard. Frank knew what questions they would ask and the order in which they would ask them. But all the while, he thought of the ivory goddess he'd scooped off the road, waiting for him on the other side of the glass, wanting to run away with him. He answered the suit's questions plainly, disinterested in the attack. He confirmed the destruction of Magic Nine and the deaths of its occupants, and when the Ultra Resort security finished and turned away, Frank stood for a moment to clear his head. The pitters milled around him, prepping the vehicle for its next run. They didn't know his next run might be it for him, that he might find out if the Autobahn really was global. Tiger Six still runs free, a funny little pitter said to him. Yeah, Frank said with a smile and nod. They had a lock on me, but I wonder why they didn't fire. The pitter smiled wide, and Frank saw his teeth filed to points from his previous life. No, no. The rockets burn. Nothing left, he said, and licked his lips. Tiger Six not for burning. Tiger Six is for eating. The End